Um, so good morning to all, and welcome to this week-long course on uh, MDGP programming with uh, HIP. So we are on uh, day four of this uh, six-day course. Uh, we are halfway through, and uh, yesterday we saw uh, we started with HIP memory after compute, uh, completing the HIP computation part, and uh, we are a little behind schedule, but uh, I think uh, the pace is fine because uh, yeah we are properly covering uh, each topic. So we might not be able to cover some special topics at the end. Uh, but anyway, we'll be using the reserve day, which is on Saturday, uh, 14th. And uh, it'll be the same timing from 9.30 to 11.30. Uh, so before we get started, uh, uh, I'll just have a small recap of uh, what we saw yesterday in memory. So I'll uh, share my screen. <clears throat> so yesterday we finished with uh, hip computation and we started uh, we just briefly introduced what uh, hip memory was on amd gpus uh, like we've been uh, We've said in the past lectures, uh, uh, host and device, uh, they do not share the same memory. And because of this, we can't use the same variables on the host and device. And there is one small exception, which we'll see uh, today. And uh, this means that we will have to maintain different copies of the same data, or the same variable on both host and device. Uh, we saw what hip mem copy uh, is and uh, how to use it to transfer data between device and host. And then we saw the memory hierarchy, uh, which consists of different uh, uh, sizes and different speeds of uh, uh, memory. We saw that the global memory is accessible to all the uh, all the threads or all the uh, compute units uh, within the GPU. And then we saw the L2 cache, which is used for uh, exploiting locality on, uh, on the GPU. It is used for that we can uh, access frequently use data quite quickly. Uh, it is faster than GRAM uh, global memory, and uh, but it is slower than L1 cache. So L1 cache is uh, uh, private to all the threads within a workgroup. Uh, L1 cache is also uh, used for the same purposes in L2 cache. Then we have the local data store, which is used to, uh, which is used just a programmable memory uh, that uh, all the threads within the workgroup can uh, write to the same location. They can access uh, the variables within uh, or the data within local data store between each other. <clears throat> then we saw that we have something called as a local memory, which is local to a thread. And uh, local memory, uh, private local memory cannot be accessed by uh, other threads. So it has, it is only accessed by, uh, it can only be accessed by that specific thread. If you try to pass it as a, uh, say, a parameter, as a pointer to another thread, then we may uh, get undefined behavior. And then we saw the uh, fastest unit of memory, which is a register, and it is used to store uh, uh, small, uh, rather frequently used uh, variables like loop counters and uh, whatnot. And then uh, apart, up, other than the device, we have the uh, host memory as well, which is our VRAM. And this VRAM is what uh, VRAM and, uh, sorry, VRAM and uh, global memory in the GPU is what uh, uh, is mainly used for transferring data from <clears throat> host to device and device to host. And uh, then we explained each of these memories in details uh, with saying that global memory is the uh, largest of all and it has uh, the longest access time. It's the slowest memory uh, available on the GPU, but it has the, it is the largest size and it usually is in the range of a few GBs. Uh, L2 cache is uh, again shared across all the compute units and it's not programmable, but it is uh, smaller than the global memory, but it is a little faster than the uh, uh, global memory. And uh, the size ranges from 512 KBs to two megabytes. 
uh, in the GCN architecture. I think in RDNA it varies a little. I think it is uh, in RDNA it is larger L2 cache and L1 cache. And then we saw L1 cache, which is uh, shared across all the threads in a work group. And uh, but this is also not programmable by the user. And uh, uh, yeah, it is smaller but faster than uh, L2 cache. And uh, it's uh, relatively smaller compared to the other one, which is 16 kilobytes in GCN architecture. And then we saw a programmable uh, memory uh, called local data store, which is shared across all the threads in a workgroup and uh, a variable which is kept inside uh, or a data item which is kept inside uh, LDS can be uh, used by all the threads in the same uh, workgroup. But uh, we have to be careful of uh, synchronization, which uh, synchronization about this shared memory. We will be seeing this uh, today, uh, how we uh, how we have to be careful when we use shared memory. Uh, but in NVIDIA GPUs, uh, the uh, shared memory or the LDS and L1 cache, uh, they share the same uh, physical storage. But when it comes to our AMD GPUs, it's a separate physical memory. So we don't have to manually allocate uh, separate data for separate uh, space for LDS. But when, if you've uh, used CUDA, you know that you'll have to uh, uh, physically split up, I mean, uh, uh, tell the compiler, tell the uh, runtime that uh, I need this much amount of data for LDS and the rest we can be used for L1 cache. <clears throat> and then there are local memory and uh, registers. As I said, it's the fastest uh, unit of memory uh, when it comes to the memory hierarchy in GPUs. And, uh, <coughs> and uh, yeah. Uh, Registers, uh, they use frequently accessed variables like loop counters. And uh, yeah. So uh, when there aren't enough registers, we spill these uh, variables or uh, spill the values in the registers to the private looping memory, which can be accessed by any other thread. It is local to a thread. And then we do, saw two kinds of special memory called as texture and constant memory. Whereas uh, texture memory is used uh, and it is optimized for uh, accessing spatially uh, relevant uh, patterns. Like uh, if we have uh, one thread uh, which accesses all the neighboring threads, then uh, this uh, this this whole thing, if it is in the texture memory, then this access can be uh, faster. It is optimized for that. And constant memory is kind of very small memory, and it is uh, it is used. Uh, uh, when all the threads uh, read simultaneously from the same location and it's the same value uh, like for some constant of uh, coefficient of uh, certain algorithms or say coefficients in uh, uh, if you say uh, quadratic or polynomial equations this can be saved inside a constant memory and uh, we can access this uh, rather quickly if it is stored in constant memory rather than in global memory We'll see this in a little more detail at the end of this uh, session. Uh, so uh, we'll move on to today's uh, topics. We'll start with performance metrics and characteristics. So before that, uh, uh, does any of you have any doubts in what we've seen so far in memory or in computation? Okay. Okay, uh, so since there are no doubts, we'll uh, start with performance metrics and characteristics. <clears throat> so the first uh, metric that we deal with is called uh, bandwidth. So bandwidth refers to the speed at which uh, uh, data can be transferred uh, to and from the GPU memory uh, in one unit of time. So usually you hear uh, terms like uh, GBPS or DBPS. KBPS. This is usually what bandwidth. Uh, this is the unit of bandwidth. So, <clears throat> when it comes to GPUs, we need a wide data bus rather than a fast data bus. And why is this? So? Because um, we need to achieve parallel data transfer, and uh, we have like uh, thousands of cores which are uh, parallelly running. And uh, so, all of these cores should be uh, properly uh, fed with uh, data, so that uh, none of these cores 
they stall for IO. So if we have, uh, uh, we need a, we need to parallel data, transfer data so that all these uh, cores are occupied with some kind of data and they don't go into uh, IO wait or stall waiting for some data. So there are multiple ways to improve the bandwidth, which is that one is that we can use data compression or we can share and reuse the data or we can uh, recompute on the GPU rather than storing it and then uh, fetching it back. So these are certain ways in which we can improve the bandwidth. And another example which I recently encountered is uh, uh, how to use bit manipulation rather than sending uh, say an array of uh, boolean values, say I have a uh, thousand boolean values, each of these boolean values will take uh, one byte each. Uh, but uh, boolean essentially uh, just uh, indicates uh, two values, which is either true or false. And uh, this can essentially be represented using a bit as well. So uh, if I have uh, four boolean, four such booleans, that will take 32 bytes. And if I take one integer, uh, that can also store uh, 32, uh -huh. that also takes 32 bytes. Uh, I mean, it is system dependent, but let's assume for now it's uh, 32 bytes. And uh, 32 bytes means I have, oh, sorry, four bytes, which is 32 bits. And uh, each of these uh, uh, 32 bits can actually represent uh, either one or zero. So uh, I can use four bits uh, of this integer to essentially represent four Boolean values. So instead of using uh, eight by uh, four bytes, so uh, four bytes to represent uh, four Boolean values, I can use four bits of an integer to uh, essentially store this uh, <clears throat> Boolean value. Which means that I can use uh, thirty-two. Uh, I, I can store thirty-two Boolean values, not exactly Boolean values, but I can represent those Boolean values, thirty-two Boolean values in one integer. So we are essentially compressing all that into one. Um, integer and then we can uh, which means that we'll uh, uh, we can essentially compress the data and uh, this this actually helps us with uh, uh, mem copy as well so if you have uh, say 100 booleans uh, you can actually uh, compress it into a much smaller thing and uh, if it's a much smaller uh, amount of data that you're trying to transfer then mem copy will obviously take uh, less amount of time so that is something uh, that we can do now, um, now we come to another metric called as latency. So latency uh, refers to, in general, it refers to the delay between requesting a service and the start of a service. So this is what uh, latency is usually uh, usually refers to. So when it comes to GPUs, uh, latency usually uh, manifests as the time required for I/O. Uh, that's one of the main uh, main uh, areas where uh, latency comes in GPUs. So obviously we want to uh, reduce the latency, which is that we don't want any delay between uh, requesting something uh, and uh, it being available uh, to us. So on CPUs, we use um, uh, latency, uh, we use caches to reduce latency. So if we, if we have, if, uh, if some program requires the data, uh, rather than uh, going all the way till uh, the uh, disk, which is the slowest, uh, uh, level of memory we uh, we have different levels of uh, caches we have uh, l1 l2 l3 caches and then we have our uh, dram and uh, then only if it's not the dram we go uh, till the disk so this um, and because uh, reading from the disk is rather very slow we use these levels of uh, different and faster memories which will help us reduce the latency and uh, on CPUs, uh, on GPUs, uh, rather, uh, this L1 and L2 caches are very small, and we have a lot of threads uh, using these L1 and L2 caches. Uh, but when it comes to CPU, uh, we have, uh, I think, uh, relatively larger L1 and L2 caches uh, compared to what we have on GPUs. So we can't uh, use the same um, idea that we have on CPUs uh, to reduce latency using L1 and L2 caches on the GPU. So in order to hide the effects of latency, we uh, exploit uh, the massive multi-threading uh, opportunity we have on GPUs. So if you see here, uh, I have uh, four blocks, uh, blocks containing uh, different number of threads, I mean, the same number of threads, let's assume for now. 
and uh, this uh, red blocks just uh, indicate that uh, those are blocks and uh, this green block uh, block means it's uh, if you look at one uh, one if you look at it vertically uh, this uh, green green block means the red block is now in execution and then we have stall cycles so what happens here is that uh, let's say the first block it gets scheduled but after some time uh, it requires some io operation so we stall it so we uh, take it out of execution and then we wait uh, for <coughs> uh, we, till we get the data so at this point uh, we can either uh, just wait till we get the data and uh, we can proceed or else what we can do is we can uh, schedule the next block while this uh, this first block uh, is waiting for uh, its data to be available and then uh, that block also goes uh, for io and meanwhile we can uh, schedule third and then the fourth and by the time the fourth one is uh, done uh, fourth one goes into its stall uh, the first one will be back <clears throat> so if you're uh, just looking at uh, a specific set of cores that core is totally occupied all the time there is no uh, latency as such even though there are stall cycles the latency is properly hidden because we are uh, scheduling the blocks in such a way that uh, uh, the stall cycles are such that the uh, cpu is occupied all the time then another uh, uh, is asking if okay uh, so sort of uh, let's assume there are four blocks and uh, all of these blocks contain a certain number of threads so uh, one block uh, let's say all the threads in that one block require a certain data to be available to them which is not uh, right now available let's say uh, we need to mem copy something in the into the uh, uh, global memory and uh, only then we can only then the block can proceed so at that time uh, uh, one thing we can do is uh, let that block continue executing on the core but it will just wait it will not do any useful work it will wait till the uh, memory is available and once the memory is available uh, let's say let's say it takes 10 seconds for the memory to be available and once uh, after that 10 seconds uh, that block continues executing again so uh, can we utilize this this 10 seconds is what we call as latency uh, this is io latency we're waiting for the data to be available uh, <clears throat> to be available to the block so can we hide this latency somehow that's the uh, if we can hide the latency we can get more uh, performance we can utilize the course we can make the uh, course more efficient so what we do is in the 10 seconds we uh, we schedule the second block uh, which let's say takes uh, two and a half seconds to execute or let's say one third of uh, 10 by 3 seconds to execute <clears throat> and again after a certain time uh, this block also uh, requires io so it also goes into wait and uh, the third block comes in uh, and then finally the fourth block comes in uh, because all the previous blocks are stalled uh, so by the time the fourth block goes into uh, wait uh, goes into the stall operation the first block uh, would have completed its uh, uh, it would have gotten all the io that it requires and uh, now this uh, block one can continue executing so what happened is that the 10 second period uh, between uh, the wait time of uh, between the wait times of uh, block one the first block uh, we we uh, utilize that wait time by uh, making other blocks execute on the same core. So the core was completely occupied during this time. And uh, that latency was hidden latency was hidden because uh, of course the uh, core was totally occupied uh, during the entire wait time. So does that uh, clear your doubt? Okay, uh, Viren is asking, does preemption happen only for IO or will it uh, will not uh, okay, as far as uh, threat scheduling is concerned, uh, that is not known uh, in CUDA as far as I know, but I'm not sure, uh, sure about uh, AMD GPUs as well. The uh, scheduling algorithm that they use, uh, if it will be uh, FCFS or uh, round robin. But uh, in my, if, if I remember correctly, or if what my assumption is right, uh, then uh, it will be uh, all the blocks will, all the threads will, Essentially, run till their completion, 
and uh, like if we have more number of uh, threads than the number of uh, cores available then all the threads if they don't have to wait for anything they'll just run till completion and then uh, only then the next set of threads will be uh, scheduled this is what i'm assuming but i'm not sure about that uh, though <clears throat> and um, i'm not sure if we can get it confirmed as well but i'll uh, i'll uh, check and see if it's possible i'll uh, get back to you tomorrow uh, so we're asking what is the amount of time it takes for scheduling uh, so we are uh, if you're talking about the scheduling overhead like uh, the context switch and uh, things like that uh, i guess it depends on the uh, hardware that we are uh, specifically dealing with <clears throat> but uh, i'm not i don't think it will be uh, that big of a won't be that much when we compare it to the stall uh, stall situation uh harshad is asking is there any uh, race condition uh as far as we are not dealing with common memory locations there won't be any uh, race condition here and uh, we will we'll assume for now there is no common memory uh, location access across these blocks uh harshda sort of that does that uh, clarify it out uh, okay we then i'll get back to you tomorrow regarding the uh, scheduling algorithm used <clears throat> okay so we'll move on to the next uh, slide uh, so this is the next concept and it's quite an important concept of uh, locality so locality uh, it refers to the tendency of a processor or a core to access the same set of memory locations over a relatively short period of time uh, so uh, like we said all the threads in a work group they access their l1 cache and uh, this uh, this presence of an l1 cache actually helps with locality it's kind of faster and uh, we can use this uh, same set of uh, the memory locations which are accessed repeatedly in the album cache rather than the group memory uh, <clears throat> so again there are uh, two main types of uh, locality that we usually deal with one is the spatial locality where uh, the tendency of a thread or a group of threads to access uh, memory addresses which are close to each other within the short period of time uh, say if uh, if i have uh, if one thread is accessing efi or Say a group of threads are accessing A of I. Then uh, in the next cycle, uh, they might be accessing A of I plus one or I plus two. This kind of an access uh, is something that exploits what is called as a spatial locality. So, uh, if in this current cycle A of zero is accessed, and in the next cycle A of one is accessed, this is what is called as spatial locality. So usually the hardware uh, takes care of spatial locality uh, by uh, bringing Uh, say if, if i request a of 0 if a thread requests a of 0 then uh, a bunch uh, not just one will be brought into the cache a set of uh, memory locations will be brought in the cache so that we can exploit spatial locality uh, <clears throat> yeah so this is uh, uh, we can see this in action when we deal with uh, uh, column major and row major accesses and then we have uh, what is called as uh, temporal locality which means that uh uh it is a tendency of a thread uh, to access one specific memory location uh, multiple times within the short period of time uh, so if if i is accessed now if i would be accessed again so if you see this um, example here we can see that if i is uh, accessed uh, four times in this loop first to uh, assign it the value of i then we are adding a constant value end to it and then we are uh, we have two writes and then two reads so yeah this is <clears throat> this is something that uh, exploits temporal locality <clears throat> this is an example of temporal locality where we are uh, using it multiple times so the idea is that uh, such uh, uh, such uh, uh, memory locations should be present in the cache for uh, more amount of time <clears throat> now uh, uh you can all take uh, i think 2 3 minutes to look at this code and uh, which uh, code exhibits more spatial locality so uh, the difference is that uh, the second and third uh, loops they are exchanged and uh, which uh, would exploit more spatial locality <sighs> Thank you. 
Uh, you can type your answers if you have any in the chat box. <clears throat> <clears throat> okay, uh, Saurabh and Harshad are saying uh, the second one. Uh, why do you think that uh, uh, that it's the second one? Is there a reason uh, why you would say uh, the second one exploits more spatial locality? Uh, uh, sir, uh, arrays are generally uh, allocated in uh, uh, row major order, so um, that's why uh, if A of I K is allocated in a, and B of J K, so in row major order, the uh, the uh, later indices changes much much faster. I mean, it's, I mean, last indices change much faster, so I K and I J will be uh, easily allocated on, continuously on the memory and B J K. Yeah, uh, that's right, uh, Saurabh. So uh, uh, we'll see how this, uh, <clears throat> how this, uh, how what would be the difference in uh, performance when we run this on an actual GPU. So I have, uh, I think I have written the code for that. I don't think I have the comparison for that. Uh, but we'll see a bigger example later where we actually uh, exploit lo locality. So yes, uh, for the first uh, piece of code, the element AFIK is accessed, uh, you can see here, AFIK is accessed uh, continuously. And uh, this exhibits a good temporal locality because the row I stays the same while the uh, K changes, K value changes. And uh, for matrix B, the element BKJ is accessed and uh, because KJ would be from different rows, they'll be they're likely to be stored in known contiguous memory locations. So this means that uh, spatial locality is not uh, it doesn't exhibit much of a good spatial locality because suppose um, uh, we bring in the first uh, row in the second iteration of that uh, in the second iteration uh, that whole row has to be taken out and a new uh, row has to be taken in. So uh, like I said, uh, in order to exhibit, uh, in order to exploit spatial locality, the hardware, it, uh, when we request for one element, it brings uh, more than the number of uh, elements that we require. So it brings a contiguous uh, uh, set of memory into the uh, cache, and then it, uh, uh, so that uh, in the next iteration, we can access the next element. But uh, in this case, what happens is, uh, even though the, the hardware brings in that contiguous memory, in the next iteration, we are asking for something that is not uh, in the set of memory that we brought in. So uh, this means that we'll have to uh, remove it from the cache and then uh, again uh, <clears throat> fill it with uh, another row. So this means that we are not exploiting spatial locality properly. So, but when when it comes to the second piece of code, again, if IK is accessed uh, and uh, this is this exploits good temporal locality. But as for uh, matrix B, uh, J is the uh, J, the J loop is what uh, is in the innermost loop, and uh, uh, consecutive memory accesses are made along the row K of matrix B. This means that uh, will be uh, when that row is brought into the cache. Uh, the subsequent accesses is also to that row which is already in the cache. So this is, this gives a good uh, spatial locality and uh, because they'll be stored in contiguous memory locations in the cache. And uh, so obviously the second one uh, would be much uh, faster when it compared to uh, the <clears throat> first one. I'll just check if, uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, Rishikesh, you have a doubt? Thank you. 
ஃபீச்சர் ஆர் ஸ்பெஷல் hardware uh, uh, optimization or performance optimization that is given by uh, the gpu itself so what happens is uh, if all the threads of a wave front access words from the same block of 64 words say for uh, thread 0 all the way up to thread 63 they access contiguous uh, uh, 64 words from the same block uh, it's okay uh, uh so if it uh, gets uh, if they if this request is to 64 contiguous uh, memory locations then all these memory locations are clocked into a single memory access so uh, this is what we call as coalescing so all the memory requests are coalesced into a single request so without coalescing what happens is um, each request would require one memory cycle each so thread 0 would uh, uh, make a request and then thread 1 thread 2 uh, thread three all the way till thread 63 but uh, if uh, if all of them go into the same uh, 64 then we can get the complete data in a single uh, cycle instead of uh, 64 memory cycles uh, so this was this is obviously uh, this obviously gives a huge performance gain uh, when it comes to uh, when it comes to performance uh, so before i move on uh, Does anybody have any doubts in the matrix and characteristic section? Uh, so memory cycle is the uh, like um, it's one uh, like uh, it's a fetch cycle. Like we need to go that get the data from uh, whatever memory it is, maybe L1 cache or L2 cache, and then you have to make it available to the current. Uh, like who requested it so that is a memory cycle okay um so let's see if i may mention huh. so one wave front contains uh, 64 threads and uh, suppose uh, all these 64 threads uh, they are uh, they request some data so we know know that they are simd uh, simd they execute in a simd fashion which means that uh, they look at the same instruction but they can access different uh, data items so if the data items accessed by all the 64 threads are uh, go into a single block of 64 uh, words if we have let, let's say in the memory uh, i have an array 0 i mean a, array of 0 array of 1 all the way till array of 64 then we have 64 uh, words which are contiguous so if uh, all these threads access within the 64 uh, uh, words in the memory then that means that uh, instead of uh, having a separate cycle separate memory cycle for each of these uh, uh, threads we we'll, we can actually bring that whole uh, chunk of 64 uh, words into the memory and uh, instead of having 64 memory cycles we have a single memory cycle is that that whole memory would be brought into the whole uh, set of contiguous 64 words would be brought uh, made available to the threads of this wave front uh, so saurabh and harshuda does that clarify your doubt okay uh, so uh, this is uh, this is a example of not an example this is an image and the question is uh, from what you understood so far uh, uh, and i'm only taking eight uh, threads in the uh, let's assume that there are only eight threads in the wave front rather than 64 uh, which of these uh, uh, access do you think are coalesced uh, you can uh, take a moment to think about it and uh, put your answers in the chat box
Brenna is saying one and three are both correlates. Uh, are there any other answers? Okay, uh, so uh, Saurav is also, Rakhav is also saying one and three, yeah. So that is uh, all of you are correct. Uh, so the first one, as you can see, it's uh, like there's no confusion here as to why it won't be correlated. So all the eight threads are accessing uh, eight contiguous words from the k contiguous words. So obviously all this memory will be made available in one memory cycle. But in case of the second one, uh, it's randomly uh, getting <clears throat> the requests are random. So there is uh, no ordering amongst them. Like it's even accessing something beyond the contiguous eight memory locations. And in the third one, even though it looks like it's random, uh, but all the eight threads are in fact accessing from the same uh, contiguous eight uh, memory locations. So this is uh, this makes sure that uh, the same it, it, the access happens in a single memory cycle. So. Just a Um, yeah, so there is a concept called as degree of coalescing, which uh, which indicates how much how much um, what is the degree of coalescing, which is essentially uh, which says how much coalescing you are actually uh, using in a specific memory access. I've not added it in the uh, slides, but you can just know that there is uh, a concept where we use something called as degree of coalescing. It, it gives a number of uh, it gives, gives, gives an indication of how much we are exploiting policing and uh, what the performance will be like. So if, uh, let's say, um, thread, uh, thread zero accesses, uh, let's say thread i uh, accesses uh, a of uh, i plus two, then we are doing something called as a strided access, which means that uh, uh, subsequent threads will access uh, a of zero, then a of two, then a of four, Something like that. So it's not uh, contiguous. So in that was and in that uh, case, it will be uh, the degree of coalescing will be, I believe, uh, sixteen or two. I have to confirm that. But uh, just know that there is uh, such a terminology which we use to indicate how much coalescing uh, is required or how much performance we can gain from uh, memory coalescing. So uh, we move on to something called as array of structures. So array of structures is essentially um, like uh, just how it says, uh, each element of the array will be uh, a structure which contains multiple fields. And uh, when, uh, when we deal with AOS, uh, it offers better locality when multiple fields of the structure are accessed together since they are adjacent memory. So uh, if you take a structure with multiple fields, in memory, all these fields will be in a contiguous location. So if we have an int, float, a double, and a char, and when you create a structure object, uh, these fields, which this in care, all this will be in a contiguous uh, memory location. And when we have an array of such structures, so let's say in float double is what we have, then we create uh, an array of 10 such structures, then we'll have in float double of the first element, then in float double of the second element and so on. And we'll have like 30 fields in 30 fields in the memory in con contiguously. But of course, each of them belonging to their own separate structures. So this kind of a layout is better for CPUs because um, uh, when multiple fields of the structure are accessed uh, together, uh, then we can uh, exploit spatial locality much better because uh, obviously when you uh, uh, when you access a specific structure, that structure will be bought into the cache. And uh, if you are accessing the fields continuously, like if you have accessing field one, field two, and field three of uh, this structure, then uh, uh, we can, uh, all of them will be available in the memory because of spatial locality in the, in the cache, and that would be much better for us. And uh, <clears throat> uh, we assume this because uh, when, when a specific thread accesses the attributes of a node, uh, it also accesses the at other attributes of the same node which uh, leads to better locality on the CPU. Which is that uh, when we usually deal with structures, we, uh, in some scenarios or 
in a lot of scenarios we uh, just access uh, all the attributes of a node continuously and so this leads to better locality on the cpu so yeah now we see something called a structure of arrays which again is just uh, uh, a bunch of arrays within a structure so there will be one structure but each field will be an array uh, of uh, say n elements so i have an int float and double then uh, in the case of aos in soa it will be one structure which contains say n uh, an array of n integers an array of n floats and an array of n uh, doubles so if you see the uh, code at the end of this slide you can see what exactly i mean here uh, we had float uh, xyz here also we have float xyz but the only thing is that uh, here we had a uh, uh, we had uh, fields which in uh, within each structure and uh, we had thousand such structures in an array whereas here we had one structure each contained thousand uh, an array of uh, thousand floats and uh, three such uh, arrays of thousand floats so uh, how is this <clears throat> How is this uh, better when it comes to GPUs? That uh, here, uh, let's assume each individual array is coalesced. So if uh, if I'm accessing uh, if I'm accessing say uh, the field X and uh, and all the uh, threads of the wavefront they are accessing the uh, simultaneous locations of this field, then uh, it'll only take one memory cycle to bring in that many uh, 64 memory locations into the uh, memory. So, because these are contiguous locations, and we can exploit, um, uh, <clears throat> we can exploit, uh, uh, we can exploit <clears throat> locality. We can exploit coalescing to get uh, better performance in this case. And um, so, yeah, each thread will process an element from the uh, arrays, and because these axes are coalesced. Uh, we'll get a much more efficient memory access on the GPU. So, uh, so will there be any constraint in size of structures for both AOS and SOP? Uh, not specifically because both of them will take essentially the same amount of memory if you take GPUs for instance. So if you take this, uh, we have three floats and uh, we have thousand of each such floats. So overall we have 3000 floats and uh, in this case also we have uh, 3000 floats the only thing is that the ordering of these elements would be different uh, in this case we'll have a uh, float xyz of the first structure and then the float xyz of second structure and so on in this case we'll have uh, a thousand x's initially then thousand y's and then thousand z so uh, when it comes to uh, size both of them will be uh, the same uh, is that what you meant by uh, constraints, sir? So, so you mentioned uh, three thousand uh, floats. So it would be around 33, uh, 23 MB of memory, I think. So it's in bytes. If each float is taking eight by eight bytes of memory. Uh -huh. uh, so uh, if the memory is, is already very uh, less, as you said earlier, on the GPU. On so the cache. Yeah. Uh, so this twenty three uh, MB would be much uh, relatively very high. Uh, that is true but um, like we have a memory hierarchy and all the way if we go all the way till uh, uh, global memory then we have uh, obviously we'll have uh, like we'll be in the uh, range of uh, gbs so even though if it is less on the cache uh, and we bring in uh, so at one point we'll only be bringing uh, uh, how much ever uh, words we can into the cache so because wavefront contains 64 threads we'll be dealing with 64 such floats at a time and when we deal with coalescing, uh, only that many uh, will be uh, brought into the cache in a single memory cycle. So uh, it won't be all the, uh, let's say, 3,000 floats at one point. Uh, it'll vary, and uh, maybe all of them may not be available in the L1 cache at the same time, but uh, some of them may be in the L2 cache, and uh, some of them will be in the uh, global memory. But um, it'll be much better. Uh, then uh, obviously uh, if we have uh, the L1 cache is small, L2 cache is small, but uh, uh, we'll be somehow uh, spilling those uh, from L1 to L2 uh, depending on which data we are operating on right now. 
so yeah all the memory will not be available in the l1 cache at at a single time but um, it will depend on how the memory access is uh yeah we're in that is correct aos is better on the cpu but uh, so is better on gpus uh, you're right for that so because of coalescing uh, when and uh, because uh, like when a thread access this the access a specific attribute of a node the neighboring thread will also uh, access the same attribute of the next node and this why does this happen because of uh, uh, because of uh, uh let's say that's how it's designed if the neighboring thread also access the same attribute of the next node then uh, it is better to have all these accesses in a single cycle which leads to better coalescing on the gpu now um okay uh, this can be a little confusing so does anybody uh, have any other doubts regarding this okay uh, so node is essentially one structure uh, so let's say points uh, i think the terminology is a little uh, confusing but yeah let's say node is one uh, structure <clears throat> okay uh, so we'll move on to uh, an example of uh, a case where uh, aos and so are so um can you guys take uh, like two two three minutes and then uh, we have two cases one is a node array of structures and one is a node structure of arrays uh, can you write the hip malloc and hip mem copy required for both this uh, piece of code assume that there are n elements in each field within the structure uh, yeah, just write the malloc and mem copy uh, statements for both of them and uh, yeah Uh, you can type it in the chat box take uh, two minutes to uh, write it up okay uh, so we'll uh, we'll compare the performance of both of them on the gpu i'll uh, show you the malloc and mem copy operations is code uh, here this sorry, this is it, yeah. <clears throat> so uh, this is uh, essentially the kernels that we saw here so one uses uh, yeah this is the node structure of uh, array of structures and this is the node structure of arrays and uh, these are two kernels which uh, essentially do the same thing one assigns uh, uh, the fields to uh, three values and the other also assigns the fields to the same value the only thing is that uh, here uh, the <clears throat> array of structures uh approach is used and here the structure of arrays is used uh yeah so here we are passing the uh structure of arrays as the uh, here we are passing the structure of arrays as the uh, parameter whereas here we are
passing the uh, fields which are essentially array arrays of the structure uh, as parameters here and we have our uh, dummy code dummy code to uh, bomb up the hype instance and uh, this is how you will be malloc uh, doing malloc for uh, array of structures uh, essentially it's the same the only thing is that you have to use size of uh, the structure instead of uh, like what we've seen so far we only dealt with primitives and we are launching the kernel with uh, that structure itself and inside the code uh, we are uh, accessing the uh, specific structure pointed by that thread ID. And then we are accessing the fields and then assigning the values. And then we are calculating the time between them. And then uh, we move on to the uh, structure of arrays part, where here, this is how we'll be allocating the uh, memory for uh, each field, which is an array of integer, an array of double, and an array of characters. And then uh, we are launching the kernel. And it's the same idea as we saw earlier. So now we'll uh, just try running it and see how it, if it works or what is the difference. So we can see that the uh, array of structures version took 79 milliseconds and the structure of arrays uh, took 34 milliseconds. So you can see the power of uh, uh, memory coercing here, how, how fast it will be, how different it will be. And, uh, when we, and of course, when we have more number of uh, elements, uh, this, kind of, uh, this, this kind of performance benefit will increase. So, and that answers the uh, question of how to malloc a structure on the GPU. And um, also, I think uh, this locality of reference uh, example also I'll show you. So this is essentially uh, used to show what happens when we uh, switch up the uh, order of arrays, order of uh, the loops, and uh, what is the performance benefit that we get when we uh, switch up the order of the loops. So essentially we are, what we are doing is we have three arrays, all of size 512 each, actually 512 into 512, so they are uh, square matrices. And uh, this line numbers 14 to uh, 30 is essentially just assigning some values to them, uh, to each element of the array. And uh, then what we are doing is we are just doing a matrix multiplication here. Uh, and uh, this first one actually uh, is the IJK loop, uh, what we saw earlier. And then uh, here we are interchanging it. So we have IK and then J. Uh, these lines just uh, reset the value of C into zero so that uh, we can compute again. And uh, if you run this, sorry, if you run this, we will get We can see that the first version took 378 milliseconds, whereas the second version, where that uh, K loop ran second, uh, K loop ran, ran as the middle loop, it took only 22 milliseconds. So you can see how much uh, there's a performance gain from uh, exploiting locality, uh, spatial locality. So this is something that always we should keep in mind when we deal with uh, contiguous memory locations is that uh, we should make sure that our memory access pattern uh, is uh, is best uh, is such a way that it's the best suited for us uh, when you when you deal with matrices uh, if you access the uh, rows in a row major order then we can gain much more performance benefit uh, so uh, we'll uh, take a quick break uh, before that does anybody have any doubts uh, with respect to what we've seen so far we'll be moving to local data store or shared memory and then we'll have uh, the final topic of special event. Uh, without uh, locality of reference. Okay, I'm not sure how much uh, faster it is, but uh, yeah, it would be faster, I think. Uh, was the loops, um, I'm assuming it was I, 
I J K in the uh, yesterday's implementation of Matplotlib. So if that was the case, then uh, obviously, then in this case, uh, it would be much faster. In fact, I have to uh, check how it was yesterday. Was I J K? Yeah. Uh, in that case, yeah, I think we'd be we will not be exploiting that much uh, performance benefit. And of course, this this complete code is run on the uh, CPU. I'm not uh, done anything on the GPU so far. So that is there. That is something that you have to keep in mind. Uh, and I think yesterday we would have done it with uh, we would have uh, run it parallel, right? So that would actually be uh, different. So we can't directly compare both of them because one is a CPU algorithm. Uh, and what is the GPU algorithm? So they won't be. Uh, we'll actually be because this is running totally serially, and the other one is running totally parallelly. Uh, might be a little uh, different for us to compare the localities here. But of course, if we compare it um, uh, on on CPU itself or on GPU, then yeah, uh, the locality would uh, come into picture. So if it is IJK, then obviously it would have uh, lower, uh, it will take much longer than IPKJ. Uh, but yeah, we can, uh, in fact, uh, compare both of them. Uh, I'll actually uh, compare it and then uh, let you know what would be the uh, difference when we uh, implement. Uh, again, but in third uh, case of Matmal, what, what we saw yesterday, it did not have a loop. Uh, in the end, only one loop was uh, there, right? The other one was totally paralyzed. Paralyzed. So, uh, I'm not sure if locality will come into picture. The locality will, in fact, come into picture there because we are still dealing with uh, that uh, k element, k row. So, we will be bringing that k into the memory and uh, k row into the memory and then uh, dealing with it. So, it is true. Yeah, we are, in fact, uh, exploiting locality there. But, uh, that's a different kind of uh, comparison because different threads are dealing with different uh, uh, <clears throat> rows in that case. Virin, does that uh, answer your note? Okay. Okay, so we'll take a 10 minute uh, break and we'll uh, start again at uh, 10 40. We'll uh, start with shared memory and uh, then move on to special uh, memory units.
Okay. Uh, any doubts, anybody? Anything in uh, policing or any of the previous topics? Okay. So we'll uh, start with uh, local data store. Uh, so LDS or local data store is a special uh, type of memory available to all threads within the thread block or uh, in uh, or, or a work group. So the use of this is that it is programmable by the user. So it's a faster memory, which is uh, so uh, it is a faster kind of memory, which is available uh, uh, and which can be programmed by the user. Uh, and when we uh, deal with small amounts of data or we want to uh, coordinate across threads within a thread block or a work group, that is when we uh, usually deal with uh, shared uh, memory. So shared memories are obviously faster than uh, accessing the global memory. And because we can program it, um, it, would be, uh, it would be better to utilize this shared memory uh, as much as we can. But uh, again, it's also a small when compared to global memory. So there's not, we can't always use it for all, uh, what, uh, all, all our uh, purposes. So this is a, a syntax of how we use uh, shared memory. Uh, we use the uh, keyword underscore underscore shared underscore underscore. And then we, uh, the data type and the variable name. Uh, and uh, in shared memory, we can in fact uh, declare uh, 2D arrays, but uh, when it comes to uh, when it comes to uh, globally allocated memory, we can't use the double uh, ind indexing uh, operator. But uh, in case of uh, local data store, it is possible, and uh, we use it like any other variable. Once we've declared it, we can uh, yeah, and uh, that whatever value that we update in one thread will be visible to all the other threads within the work group. So um, this is a, a small example. We can, uh, you can take a moment and then uh, take like two, three minutes to uh, write a kernel, or at least give the idea of how to write a kernel, uh, which takes a matrix M containing uh, 1024 into 1024 elements and uh, modifies each element of uh, each element mij to uh, mij plus mij plus one, and if the element is on the boundary, which is if it's the if it's an element from the last column of the uh, last element of the index, then we won't update it because we may get a index out of bound access, or we'll get the wrong wrong uh, access because it's stored stored as a one d array uh, in the memory. And uh, try to exploit exploit shared memory uh, as much as you can, and then assign each row to a thread. Uh, I think there's a typo there. So one uh, row should be assigned to one thread block. Of course, there will be uh, one row to four elements in one thread block. <coughs> You guys can post uh, your, you have to write the kernel or uh, you can just post your ideas uh, if it's too uh, hard to write the kernel. Or if you write the kernel, that's also fine.
Okay, so um, we'll move on to one solution that uh, we have. So, um, will the below solution work? Because uh, we are dealing with uh, 1024 threads and 1024 uh, uh, blocks, uh, we'll assume that uh, the thread ID can be used to index into the rows and uh, block ID can be used to index into the columns or like the other way around. So uh, will this below solution work? Uh, and if not, uh, what would be the problem uh, with the below solution? Uh, take a minute and uh, think about it. And uh, you can post your answers in the chat box. Is this uh, is the code clear to everybody? Uh, said, uh, should I explain it as to what is happening? So essentially, uh, J we are giving as a column index, and I will be taken as the row index. We're calculating the index, and then we are checking if the if it's less than mat matrix size minus one, which is that we are not considering the last uh, uh, element of each row. And if it is so, then we are uh, adding M of index with the uh, element at uh, the next index. OK, uh, so there is a problem here, which is that uh, there are uh, multiple threads updating the same uh, memory location. Or Sorry, uh, what we expect is that uh, when I read, uh, when I update M of index, uh, the next element, which is the M of index plus one, would be the original value that is in uh, the array M. But the problem is that when you're dealing with this many threads, uh, one thread may have already updated M of index plus one uh, with some other value. So we'll not get the expected uh, outcome, output that we need. Uh, say, uh, let's say thread 63. Uh, is uh, trying to update M of 63 and thread 64 is updating M of index of uh, M of uh, 64. In this case, um, uh, if thread 64 already updates M of uh, 64 and adds the value in M of 65 to it, then uh, when M of 63 tries to update its value, it would have seen the newly updated value of M of uh, 64, which is 63 plus one, uh, and it try, it reads the updated value. So this is not what we expect. We expect uh, uh, we didn't. That's not exactly true. We'll see how uh, we can, uh, in fact, parallelize it. Uh, but again, it will not be totally parallel. But it'll be better than uh, sequential execution. So yeah, there is a problem here which is that we won't be able to um, <clears throat> get the expected output because uh, uh, other threads may have already uh, updated the next value that we're trying to read. So uh, we'll uh, uh, try to use shared memory. And uh, so uh, we'll uh, maintain a different uh, array, which will take in, like, because we are launching this kernel for each row of the matrix. Uh, what we'll do is we'll save the row of, uh, we'll save each row uh, of the matrix into a shared memory. And we'll uh, save that uh, in the variable shared row. Uh, and uh, we'll use that for uh, subsequent uh, uh, processing. So essentially, first we'll, uh, uh, before, uh, so the idea is that, uh, we first save a copy of the uh, original array, and then we use that saved copy uh, to update the, uh, so that we'll have the original values. Because we are updating on, uh, updating m of index plus equal to m of index plus one on the original array, we're making a copy of the same, uh, 
copy of the row and then using that uh, uh, unmodified uh, array uh, to update our uh, code update our uh, value so uh, is this is this clear to is this piece of code clear to everybody and uh, does it have any problem Uh, no, boundary elements are again handled uh, in that if condition, right? So only if J is less than matrix size minus one, only then we are uh, matrix size will be one zero two four, and only if it's less than uh, so that would make sure that the last element is not updated. Whatever happens, is that what you meant, Virun? Uh, If block one executes before block zero, then the last element of block zero will be wrong. Um, why would that be the case, uh, Viren? Because uh, we are not updating the previous element, right? We are uh, like we are reading the next value and then updating the current index. Like we are reading the next index. Like so, so the uh, first element of block, first element that the block one uh, reads would be uh, the zeroth element, and then the first element. So, why would it uh, read uh, the last? I mean, why would there be an update on block zero? Last element of block zero. Okay, block zero one zero two three plus equal to uh, So this update will not happen, right? Because uh, matrix size is uh, one zero two four, and uh, because that there's a condition if j less than one zero two three, only then the update will happen. So uh, in this case, uh, j is one zero two three. So that condition will be false for that uh, specific case. Is that what you meant, Peter? So how, how is the last element of each? So the last element of each block will not be updated. So that was uh, mentioned in the question that uh, if the element is on the boundary, which is that the uh, last column of each row will not be updated, uh, will not update it. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> so, um, so will this uh, solve the problem? Like. Earlier, we were using the same array, and uh, some threads may have updated uh, the next uh, the next element. So we made a copy of it, and then uh, used that copy to update the value. So will this work? So uh, this will also not work. So this is where we get uh, introduced to synchronization. So we'll not uh, see synchronization in detail here, uh, which will be uh, in the next uh, next topic that is hip synchronization. But um, I'll uh, slightly touch over it today, where we are using some synchronization constructs. So uh, the problem here is that uh, again, even if we are doing this, making a copy, uh, say one thread is. Uh, so the, the problem with uh, threads is that uh, they may execute out of order, like not out of order. Like uh, uh, let's take threads outside of wavefront. Let's take thread zero and let's say thread thread thousand. So they're definitely not in the same wavefront. So uh, while thread one is executing, uh, say line number four, this thread thousand may be executing uh, line number the last line where it is updating. So that can happen. So that is something that uh, is possible, and it is it is very well, very much possible that it can happen. And why is it so? Because um, that is how it is designed. So only wavefronts they execute the same instruction, but the others, if all the threads are assigned, they may uh, some may execute faster than the other. So that that is totally possible. So uh, while we make a copy itself, while we make shared row of J 
is equal to mf index there might be some thread uh, say thread 64 may have already updated uh, uh, mf index with the uh, shader of j plus one so this may actually lead to wrong results as well because uh, yeah that's also a possibility so uh, because of this we make sure that uh, all the threads copy their corresponding elements uh, into the shared row and uh, we wait till that copy is properly completed and only then we move to the updation part so uh, this is what we call as a barrier and uh, in uh, uh, when we come to uh, within a thread block uh, sync threads underscore underscore sync threads is uh, something that we use to make sure that uh, No, uh, so uh, that is true. Uh, we are creating an array of uh, not all blocks, but one block, which is that one uh, work group will uh, share that entire uh, row. So like I said, uh, uh, each block will contain one zero two four elements and uh, one thread will be essentially, uh, each thread will deal with, uh, one block will deal with uh, one row. So. Uh, when one block deals with one row, uh, shared row will contain a copy of the original uh, row that we are dealing with. Yeah, each thread in that block will see the entire shared row. That is correct. So uh, what we do is we make sure that that this copy, this copying, we're making a copy of uh, uh, shared row of J and uh, this copy has to be completed before we uh, use this shared row of uh, shared row array. So, which is why we put a barrier and uh, sync threads will, will essentially make sure that all the threads within that thread block or within that work group has completed all the instructions before uh, the barrier. So, the copy will be totally complete before we move on to the next uh, uh, line of code, which is the condition check and the uh, updation so uh, is the concept of a barrier or sync threads clear to uh, we'll we'll see why exactly there is a data race here uh, uh, in the next uh, section uh, so is this concept clear as to why we are using sync threads and uh, what exactly sync threads does again sync threads is just uh, making sure that it's like a, a hip device synchronized where we where we say that uh, only till only once all the gpu uh, computation is done we'll wait at that point so similarly sync threads is uh, something which we do within the gpu where only once all the threads at that uh, within that block have has completed all the uh, instructions before the barrier Till that point, uh, all the other threads will wait at sync threads. And uh, once it is completed, so uh, all the 1024 by 64 wave fronts will take a copy. Yeah, that is true. Uh, so only once all the threads uh, have made their copy, only then we'll uh, uh, continue. And of course, wave fronts will, uh, we'll see an example where wave fronts come into picture, but um, yes, that is true. So all the threads, not just wave fronts, wave fronts, all the threads within uh, all the ones through two, four threads, only once they've uh, completed their uh, uh, copy, uh, then only we'll uh, move on to the next, <coughs> uh, next uh, instruction. Uh, so does that clear your... Uh, So uh, sync threads is essentially used to synchronize threads within a work group. So the only thing is that it waits till uh, it ensures that there is a, all the threads will wait. Uh, it will finish all the reads and write and all the instructions before it is completed before uh, we do any further computation. Now uh, we'll see another example of uh, where we uh, deal with uh, shared memory. Uh, so this is essentially a kernel. So uh, 
the question is what are the uh, possible outputs of the pillow program or what what is there a, can we have multiple different outputs or how many outputs are possible here uh, assuming that the kernel is launched with a single block containing 1024 that's what are the different possible outputs that uh, we can expect here uh, you can take like two minutes and uh, so essentially uh, there's a printf statement here and uh, uh, the uh, expect the question is that what can you expect uh, to be printed here so we have a shared uh, variable uh, s uh, which will be uh, shared across all the 1024 elements and then we uh, assume that uh, uh, s is initialized to zero actually uh, don't assume that uh, uh, let's assume S is not initialized at all. <clears throat> we can take the code as is. Uh, there is no initialization to S at the moment. So in that case, what can we expect uh, the output to be? Uh, Saurabh, uh, uh, why is there uh, like uh, you put the four outputs? Is that all the expected output, or is that a single output? It's just zero and zero. Uh, uh, it will be updated value. I think uh, this is equal to one. This is equal to three. Like these are the possible answers. Is what is like okay. different. Yes. Okay, so Viren has said uh, Suro one and garbage. Uh, Saurabh was saying Suro Suro one three. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, so the both of you are right. Thing is that we can get uh, different outputs. Like uh, this will not be a deterministic output, and the output may depend on uh, the hardware on which you're running the clock speed and scheduling and all that it will depend on all this factors but the expected output is that uh, if you look at it sequentially uh, we would expect s to be uh, initialized to zero and uh, then we make it one and then we add uh, plus equal to two to it which makes it uh, three the and we expect the final value to be printed to be three uh, that would be what we expect in a sequential setting if uh, if we were uh, executing it sequentially, but like multiple possible answers are there. So suppose if uh, uh, if thread uh, if thread zero reads the value of s uh, uh, reads the initial value of s and then updates to zero. Meanwhile, at the same time, thread uh, one twenty eight also reads the initial value, uh, which can be anything, which can be zero or garbage, uh, and then uh, updates it and uh, uh, thread zero writes this value. Uh, meanwhile, thread one reads the existing value and then writes the value one. And only after that, if thread one twenty eight uh, writes the existing value, we may get an output of uh, zero or uh, two or some garbage value. And uh, so this um, reading and writing, uh, this that part, we'll I'll explain it in the uh, synchronization. Uh, part uh, we possibly be starting it today at that point it will get a little more uh, clearer but at that at, at right now we can uh, say that we don't know which thread uh, will execute which instruction first so uh, thread zero may execute uh, first while thread uh, 128 has already updated or it is possible that uh, uh, thread uh, 128 uh, executed the initial s plus equal to two before thread zero could read the value or even after uh, thread zero read the value. So all of this is possible. Now, uh, where all do we need to put a barrier? In this, uh, where all uh, do we need uh, to put 
sync threads essentially uh, can you take a moment and uh, see where all we need uh, sync threads we're in a saying at two places we'll be needing it one before uh, uh, the uh, condition check of 128 and one before the printf. Uh, before the printf or before uh, the uh, comparison itself. After S is initialized to it. So, uh, Saurabh, I didn't get your uh, statement. Before S, after S is initialized to zero. Okay. Uh, you're saying after the thread ID X dot X is equal to equal to zero, uh, S equal to zero, we put a. Uh, okay. <clears throat> okay. Uh, uh, yes, we're in we can always assume that uh, zero to 63 will be in the same way front. Uh, the fact is, uh, all of you are right, even though there is a slight contradiction. Uh, between uh, both your answers. The thing is that uh, we can put sync threads after s equal to zero as well, but the only thing is that it will not, uh, uh, it's actually redundant because uh, thread id x dot x equal to zero and thread x dot equal to one uh, will be executing in simply fashion. So even if we put a sync threads uh, between them, uh, it won't uh, matter because they'll essentially be looking at the same instruction at the same time. So we can put it, uh, it won't have any uh, performance impact as far as I remember, uh, but it will be redundant. But uh, definitely the places where we need it is before the comparison to 128 and before the comparison to zero before the final printf. So at both these locations we'll need a sync threads uh, so that uh, we make sure that we get the proper output. Uh, like I said, uh, if you're only dealing with uh, threads within a wave, wave front, then we don't need to uh, use explicit synchronization because they already uh, execute in a synchronized fashion thanks to the SIMD uh, nature of their execution. So we'll uh, see a piece of code where we use sync threads uh, and we'll see what the uh, output is. So initially I'll uh, run it without uh, uh, sync threads and see what is the expected output. So uh, here, um, in order to, because uh, it is it is always, uh, there's always a chance that we'll get the expected output because that is also one of the possible outputs. But uh, what we need is we need to make sure that that's the only possible output and that's where we use barriers. But uh, in order to uh, make like, uh, why I've put uh, this kernel launch in a loop and why I'm launching two blocks is because uh, we need at least one of these uh, outputs to we need to see that there might be a wrong output possible so like even if i run it now it is possible that we'll get the expected output three but that may not always be the case so we'll uh, just see if we are uh, getting the expected output So if you see here, some of the threads have updated the value as three, and then we have some threads which have updated it to one. So this is actually a uh, like a good example as to see why there will be a data uh, Like yesterday when I tried it, I did not get, I got all ones, but this is actually a very good example. The output is proper in this case. So we can see that uh, this proper data is because uh, we should have all the threads should have printed three in any uh, in the right scenario, but uh, some threads they've uh, uh, written three. Some kernel launches have written three, and some have uh, uh, one, and uh, yeah, the rest are all ones. So this is actually a proper a good output to show that there is a data race. <clears throat> now what we'll do is we'll uh, uncomment uh, these sync threads and see if we are getting the expected output.
Then I'll save it. Why do you think we did not get the answer? Let me just compile again. Does anybody see any uh, error in the code which might lead to a uh, wrong answer? See what exactly went wrong here. Hmm. Okay, we'll just go through the code once again while we wait for the Does anybody see a problem with the code? Let's see once again while we uh, wait for the resource to get allocated. Oh, sorry. <coughs> Because we have editing a different file. <laughs> okay, uh, so we have to uncomment the same threads here. Okay, that was a mistake on my end. Okay, that's the same code, but I was editing a different file which was local to my system, and we are on the HPC uh, server. Okay, now we can try. Unfortunately, we are waiting for uh, resources to get allocated. Okay, we'll come back to this uh, and I'll show you the output. So, um, do we need some, uh, and uh, this was the same uh, question that we saw earlier. Do we need synchronization somewhere? And uh, we've seen that we need uh, we need it here and here. And definitely not. Uh, it's not required after the uh, current uh, the uh, first line because <clears throat> because of the fact that they'll be from the same wavefront. Now we'll deal with uh, we come to dynamic LDS so that. Okay. Now we'll uh, see the. Uh, now we can see that the output is all threes. So yeah, there was a small mistake on my end, which was that I was updating the wrong file and we were getting the same output. But right now we can see that once we put up the barriers, we are getting the expected output that we need. Now, before we move on to dynamic, <coughs> dynamic LDS, uh, does anybody have any doubts in so far in any of the programs that you've seen or in uh, what we've seen in LDS so far? <clears throat> okay, so uh, uh, when do we use dynamic uh, LDS? So uh, when we don't know how much uh, LDS memory we need at compilation, we use some, something called as dynamic shared memory. So this is a like we need to specify this as a third parameter of the kernel launch, like how much data we need. And we'll see the syntax now. So in order to uh, tell the uh, uh, runtime that this is a, or the compiler that this is a um, 
dynamic memory. We use the keyword extern before we use the shared keyword. And uh, this will say that, okay, uh, you don't need to allocate the memory at, uh, at during compile time. And uh, suppose this variable n is a, a variable which is passed, which is given by the user. Then uh, we pass it as a third parameter n into size of int because we are dealing with an integer. And uh, the uh, in case of the uh, kernel uh, hip kernel launch GGL case, that's all. There also it's the there also it's the fourth parameter if I'm not wrong. And there's a fifth parameter called as stream parameter. But uh, when we launch it like that, we don't need to uh, deal with the other parameters. We just specify how much space this required here. So that much amount of space will be given to uh, this uh, variable right here. And uh, we can then use it like how we use it. Uh, again, we are using sync threads here because we need a barrier between the printf and the previous statement. So that is about it uh, with uh, uh, dynamic uh, or local data store. Uh, if any of you have any doubts, uh, uh, we, uh, you can uh, ask now. Uh, because of the uh, like lack of time, I've actually skipped a topic uh, containing uh, bank conflicts. So but I'll, uh, uh, why do we use? Uh, so uh, we may not, not always know. Like if suppose uh, uh, we are passing the size of an array as a parameter or we get the uh, from a user input we get uh, the, the value of n in that case uh, we can't uh, during compile time we can't we can't mention what uh, how much size we'll be needing like one other way is we can pass it as a parameter and then uh, uh, use it in <clears throat> use it uh, uh, in the normal way but uh, how does the kernel know that the dynamic size should go to variable size? So okay, uh, okay. In 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 any case, if there are there is another variable, if you're saying that it should go to the variable s, that is because we've used the extern keyword. So ah, uh, in case of multiple dynamic variables, uh, how much ever uh, size that you assign here, so that will be shared by both the dynamic variables, dynamically. Uh, uh, Variables which are dynamically with. that is uh, variables which have the extern keyword uh, prefixed. Right? So if I give uh, n into size of uh, int as my total, uh, and I have uh, two uh, dynamic variables s and t, so that uh, n into size of int, uh, whatever that is, will be shared by both s and t. And how we use it, it depends on us. We uh, like so that whole memory will be given to both s and t. Uh, we can, in fact. Uh, we have to make sure that we don't uh, access it in the wrong way. Or if we have uh, two such integers, we should initially do two into n into size of int. If we have, uh, if you require two arrays of size n each. Other than that, if we uh, if we launch with a single array and then uh, we need s, both of them will share the same memory. So uh, the, it's the programmer's responsibility to make sure that uh, this does not happen. That overlap does not happen. Uh, does that uh, clarify your doubt, Viren? Okay. <clears throat> so, um, yeah, like I said, uh, bank conflicts is a topic which I've skipped uh, for now because as it is, we're supposed to start synchronization today. So, uh, I'll start with the uh, uh, special memory topics. Banking is, uh, bank conflicts is, uh, again, uh, a topic which is like memory policing, uh, where we access contiguous, where we access something called as banks data. Uh, so I'll see if there is uh, time in the uh, on Saturday. Uh, if so, we'll uh, cover uh, bank conflicts then. So we'll move to some special memory topics, which are uh, like I said, texture memory. So texture memory, it's a uh, fast and read-only memory. It is optimized for 2D spatial access. Uh, but the thing is that uh, all the APIs related to texture memory are now deprecated. So uh, it is possible that uh, we will not be able to use texture memory in the future. So again, because of the lack of time, I, I would have showed a example, even though it's deprecated, but because of the lack of time, I'll just uh, skip the example for now. But uh, we can very well expect that it will be deprecated. It's uh, deprecated in both uh, CUDA and HIP. If you try to use the uh, texture memory related APIs, uh, the compiler itself will give a warning saying that uh, uh, 
uh, you should not use it and uh, this may get uh, removed pretty soon so we'll uh, talk about constant memory this is also a read only memory and uh, we use it when multiple threads use the same constant value and how do we define it we use the uh, underscore underscore constant underscore underscore uh, prefix to the variable and uh, in order to copy this uh, uh, value some value into the device we use the api hip mem copy to simple and then we pass the uh, variable name and the value that we want uh, and then we use the uh, how much size are we copying and inside the kernel we use it uh, like how we use any other variable so that's with constant memory and there is something called as unified memory uh, which is that um, uh, so both uh, some area in the uh, uh, vram and dram will be unified uh, so that we can use uh, it like it's a single memory so this actually avoids the need for copying data manually between the host and device side. like we can use the same uh, variable name in both host and uh, device we don't need to do the whole mem copy thing manually and maintain two variables uh, so it will be just uh, if if you see in this example uh, uh, array is uh, let's say array is a uh, uh, variable which is uh, it's an array and that variable we can use in both device and host code so how it works is if the device tries to access some data uh, which is not on the gpu uh, like uh, so suppose uh, it's a unified memory right and uh, this tries to access this variable and because uh, uh, this <clears throat> is not on the gpu uh, a page fault will occur and uh, this will make the uh, there's something called as memory migration engine and this will move the data from the host to device automatically we don't have to deal with mem copy so uh, how to use it is that we use uh, the api called uh, hip malloc managed and uh, this will create a unified memory uh, and we pass the address of the pointer uh, and then uh, we allocate that the amount of memory that we need so this makes sure that uh, uh, we don't have to manually copy it every time so this will automatically be uh, synchronized and then we have something called as pinned memory pinned memory uh, refers to the uh, host memory which is page log dot pinned so uh, so the uh, os uh, so this kind of uh, pinned memory will uh, prevent the operating system from uh, swapping out that portion so those of you who are familiar with paging uh, virtual memory uh, this por some portion of the memory will be swapped out into the disk but uh, pinned memory will uh, always uh, be resident on the ram so uh, memory transfers between host and uh, device will be faster when we use pinned memory because uh, uh, because uh, because the DMA transfer does not require a copy to a staging buffer. So, and or even if we see it in a much more uh, simpler sense, we can see that uh, uh, the uh, like when we request for a specific data to be available uh, due to paging, this uh, page might not be on the RAM, so it might be in the disk. So, if it's a pin memory, that page will be uh, definitely available on the uh, RAM itself or. Uh, on the fastest possible memory uh, available so uh, when it's pinned we can be we can be assured that it will be on the ram it will be resident on the ram so this makes uh, uh, things a little bit more faster so in order to allocate a pin memory we use the hip host malloc uh, function and then release it with hip host free so there is a difference between unified memory and uh, pin memory is that uh, Unified memory, it provides a single address space for both the host and the device. Uh, and the uh, system will handle the data migration part. But uh, pinned memory is about optimizing the data transfer rates between the existing host and device memory spaces. So it's just that uh, we'll uh, remove the whole paging overhead uh, when GPU requests for some uh, data. Uh, it will already be available on the RAM. It will not be uh, swapped out of memory. Uh, it will always be present on the RAM. So this is what uh, pin memory is. And with this, we conclude uh, the memory section of uh, our uh, uh, lecture. So uh, if anybody has any doubts, now would be a good time uh, to clarify it. You can unmute or you can put it in the chat box. And uh, uh, if you have a doubt, you can stay back. Others can uh, drop off if, uh, because it's already 11.30. 
uh, if anybody has any doubts, they can stay back and uh, we can discuss your doubt. Uh, no, that is not the case. Uh, if the program goes out of execution, obviously that uh, pin memory will also be released. And one thing with print memory is that uh, you should make sure that you don't use a lot of uh, uh, print memory uh, because uh, because using print memory means that on the RAM you're uh, making sure that these uh, these these memory locations are uh, definitely pinned. They won't be sparked out. So if you use your complete RAM for print memory, then the rest of the system functions will not work. So you have to make sure that uh, there is uh, enough space for other like required or required processes like the voice of kernel or other functions to run. Uh, so if that's not the case, if host free is not used even so, that uh, memory will be uh, removed because once the program goes out of execution, whatever resources it was holding, it will be released. But if we want to manually uh, deallocate it during, uh, during our execution, we can use it host free. So with pin memory, uh, just make sure that you don't uh, use it, use a lot of uh, memory for, uh, you don't pin a lot of memory. Okay, so uh, if nobody has any doubts, we'll uh, close for today. And uh, uh, thank you all of you for joining. Uh, we'll uh, meet today, we'll start with synchronization tomorrow. Uh, so have a good day. And I'll be here for another uh, two, three more minutes if anybody has any doubts or if any concept needs to be uh, explained again.